Greetings from Woods Chapel United Methodist Church, and thank you for taking the time to listen to this message. We invite you to worship with us. Our Sunday worship times are 8 a.m., 9.05 a.m., 10.10 a.m., and 11.15 a.m. We're located off Highway 291 between Woods Chapel Road and Lakewood Boulevard in Lee Summit, Missouri. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at 816-795-8848 extension 321. We hope you find this message meaningful and relevant in your daily life. Today is our last Sunday in uh, the series on inquiring minds questions from from the congregation. I want to apologize to those of you that submitted a question that didn't get answered because we couldn't get to all of them and also to those of you who got your question answered but not in the way you hoped it would be answered. Uh, I just want to remind all of us that, that, that sometimes when we get answers that push us or stretch us, those are opportunities for us, us to grow. So we, we enter this process prayerfully and joyfully, and I hope that it's been helpful. Next Sunday um, will be uh, first Sunday in Lent, and we'll be starting a series uh, on, on God's love, about a loving God. Uh, how his love enters our, our world and, and, and what, we, what we do with that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity for honest, honest talk about questions that we have, and I pray that you bless these words, that they would touch many, and I thank you for your scriptures that always speak to us. So bless these moments in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, two weeks ago, um, I mentioned the word cremation but didn't get to it. And since then, I've been bombarded with, when are we going to get to cremation? When are we going to get to cremation? I had no idea it was such, a, such an important topic. Um, let me start with, I have, I have always grown up in the Christian church with this idea that to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord, and we'll read that in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. Therefore, we're always confident and know that as long as we're at home in this body, we're away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. What does that mean? It means that when we die, Christians believe that we're going to our time of judgment and our heavenly home. It means that you don't wait in the grave uh, waiting for for that time. You don't sit around for 500 or a few thousand years, whatever it's going to take for for Jesus to to, to come back. Uh, Resurrection is is an important teaching in the Christian faith, but it's not like you're going to wait in the grave until that time. So what's all the worry about about cremation? Um, When the Christian church began, there were pagan cultures that burned their dead. And it's a common practice throughout history because, frankly, when we die, something must be done with us. You know, something just must be done. And um, you picture the Viking ship with the Viking king, and it's slid on fire and pushed out into the sea, and the Viking rises up to Viking heaven. And uh, the funeral pyres where they would build... uh, uh, sticks and logs and put the person on top and, and light that all on fire and, and off, off they would go. Well, early Christians were against that for two reasons. The first one was the pagans were doing it and we wanted to be different from the pagans. Uh, the other reason they were against it was because they just believed that God needed a body for the resurrection. Consequently, there are graveyards everywhere and if you go to Rome, down under the city, and in many other places, there are catacombs just filled with bodies because in order for God to fulfill his promise of resurrection, he, he needed a body to, to work with. Now, this theory was ignored by Christians uh, when there were great battles where there were many dead or during the time of the plague. Um, they conveniently said, well, I know we're not supposed to, but it's okay. Let's pile them all up and burn the, the bodies. And uh, the, the fact of the matter is that all of us eventually um, go back from whence we came. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, even bones are gone if enough time is passed. So uh, God's not really helped by us trying to preserve our bodies. And it's almost kind of funny that we think that God needs our help 
to find us in the time of, of resurrection. You have to wonder what would happen to people that, that lost their life in a house fire or what happened to the folks uh, at the World Trade Center or if you were eaten by a shark, heaven forbid, that God would say, boy, I'd like to raise that person, but I, I don't know where to begin. I don't know where to find them. Um, be well assured. The important part of your life is your soul. And if God needs to find your body parts, believe me, if he can make a life begin from two cells, he can certainly find what he needs to raise you at the last day. So do not worry about your loved ones who have been cremated. And if you're planning to do so, um, it's about the soul. It's not about the body. Question two, is it okay to pray for prosperity? I want to trust God for the plans he has to prosper me with a hope and a future, That's a, they're quoting Jeremiah, but I seem to be stuck. I wonder, since my life has been so good up to now, how can I ask for more? Friends, you can pray for whatever you want. You can pray for enormous, great, and wondrous things. And I want you to pray and believe for God dreams, God's dream for your life, but you always have to pray um, in perspective. Uh, Jesus did this in the garden, not my will, but thy will be done. Uh, we, we have to remember that Jesus, when he taught his prayer, what did he say? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day our daily prosperity. Give us this day our daily bread. He taught us to focus on the soul, and as far as living this life meant, uh, we needed to focus on our daily needs, not collecting more and more. And this is unfortunately something that Americans have become very fond of, is wanting more and more and more. I fear if we're not careful, the answer to the question, the answer to the prayers that we will receive is the scripture from James chapter 4. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. If you pray for more, remember to whom much is given, much is required. We are blessed not simply so we can have more, but we are blessed to be a blessing. And you can see this, this thought being lived out in the hearts of Christian people who've been blessed greatly, and it's a burden to them. They're concerned, oh God, you've given me so much, how can, I, how can I give this away to help others? That's the attitude that God seeks to have instilled in us. And I just want to remind you that um, although we may want to pray for prosperity and blessings, the people in Africa, they already think you all are blessed, and me too. So we need to keep our prayers in, in spiritual perspective. Question three, if I believe in God, why do I fear death? Trust, 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 trust. Trust, trusting, trust. Robin Fisher, if I knocked on your door, it's a surprise. Robin, I need you to come with me. I can't tell you where we're going. I'm not sure when you're going to be back. Would you come with me? Will you go? Ann says no, but Robin says yes. Huh? And I would go with you because I know you and I trust you, okay? Now, if I go knock on some random door, hello, I'm here for you, come on, it's time to go. I don't know if you're ever gonna come back, what are they gonna do? They're gonna call the police. And that's what some Christians are doing when it's time, when they're on their deathbed. They're going, hey, is there anybody else there? Come get me, come say, I don't know who this is. I'm, I'm not saying that those Christian people that are afraid don't know him. I'm saying we need to work harder on building a relationship of trust, on spending time with God, on working the relationship to where when, when Jesus comes for us and stretches out his hand and we take it and head toward the pearly gates, we are grasping on to a trusted, loving friend. Um, it's not an easy thing, but if you're fearing death, work on your relationship with God. Think about the word trust. Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? You are with me. You are with me. The one I know, the one I love, the one I trust. God walks with us at the time of death. Question four. 
If a person has never heard of Jesus and could not have committed their life to Christ, what happens to them when they die? How do other religions fit into the Christian view of going to heaven? I'd like a volunteer from the audience now to come forward to take this question, please. After last service, one of our fine members said, Jeff, you should get tap shoes because you kind of tap danced around that all very nicely. Um, let me say to you, it's not my intention to give you a definitive answer to this question. But here's what I want to do. I want to invite you to think beyond the narrowness of some of our theology to a God who is bigger and greater and mysterious and is hard to contain just by the ideas that we would like to nail him down with. I want to hold up three scriptures for you and ask you what they say about salvation. Scripture number one. From John 14, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you know him and have seen him. What does that scripture say to you about salvation? That Jesus is the only way. And taken all by itself, man, it causes us all to worry about everyone else in the world. It draws a very small circle around the concept of salvation. And I'm a Christian minister. I'm not going to argue with this very much, folks. But let's look at another scripture. Luke 10, it's the beginning of the um, um, Good Samaritan story, but there are several other passages in the Gospels that are very, very similar. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is a salvation question. What is written in the law? Jesus replied. How do you read it? The man answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now my point here is not to open up a whole bunch of questions in your mind or or, or, or wonder about what you believe, but I just want you to know, Jesus didn't say at this moment, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He had every opportunity to do that. For some reason, he drew the circle a little bit bigger, it seems to me. Scripture 3, um, Romans 1.20. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. What does this scripture say to you about salvation? It says the pygmies in Africa are without excuse. It says that all over the world, there is no one that has not heard. There is no one who's going to stand up on the judgment day and say, I didn't know. Because God has made himself known. What does that tell me about my theology? Boy, we humans are good at drawing very tight circles. I want to ask you to remember that, that our relationship with God, yes, it involves choices we make, but it also involves God's activity. In fact, one great theologian said, God always plays the principal role in the drama of rescue. God is everywhere, and he is working everywhere in the synagogue, in the mosque, in the forest, in places where people don't believe at all, in, people where, in places where people are doing and saying terrible things. God is present and he is working. And those people, they don't believe like us, but they are without excuse. Somehow God has made himself known and they are accountable to that. So what do you do? Well, I want to tell you, I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and if you want to talk salvation, we're going to talk about Jesus. And if I go to Africa, and I go to places that have never heard about the gospel, I'm going to talk about Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we know. All of us need to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. But I want to invite you not to put your trust or your worries and some of the tight little theologies that we have written for each other over the years, but trust in a God who is big and great, and to remember that we don't get to decide 
who gets in and who doesn't. It's entirely up to him. Question five. What about faith and works? Faith without works is dead faith, but we only get to heaven through the grace of God? How can that be? The first passage that I learned when I was in confirmation class was from the book of Ephesians. By grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And often we leave that scripture off there. But if you read on, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The answer is both. I mean, they're both there. This is a, a, a classical discussion of the Christian faith. Wesley said it this way, no one is saved by good works, but no one is saved without them. I would say this to you, God's grace cleanses us, changes us, makes us new people so that we can learn to give our lives away in the name of Jesus. They're supposed to go together. I wonder if we see a Christian person and they're not engaged in taking a cup of cold water, what does that mean about their conversion? What does it mean about their life? One of the saddest stories of, of God's people is the thief on the cross who says, today remember me in paradise. His whole life he did terrible things. He never got to do anything good in the name of Jesus. He never got to love someone else. If you're a Christian, your decision is important, but it's just the beginning. The Holy Spirit changes you, and, 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 and we are supposed to learn to give ourselves away. Um, our decision, our, our, our faith, and our, our life are, are supposed to go together. Question six, what is repentance? How does it feel? It feels good. Steps to take. How do you find repentance? Finding real change in your life. In the book of Acts, Peter is preaching, Acts chapter 3, Repent then, turn to God, that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come to your soul. Repentance is a word that means turn around, turn around. Start going a different direction. And it's interesting that when we hear the word repentance, we feel great burdens of, 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 of guilt coming upon our back because now we have to do different things. True repentance is followed with a sense of refreshing and freedom and joy because we're alive in Christ. Repentance mean, means I turn from my sin. But you know, that not whether or not you play cards, not, oh, I'm a Christian now, should I wear my hair differently? Oh, I'm, I'm a Christian now, is it okay for me to wear makeup? To turn from your sin means to turn from selfishness. And that is a lot more difficult than to turn from a list of rules. It means that we look inside of our heart and we pray, God, help me take a fearless moral inventory. Search me, try me, see what's there. Show me ways that I've been selfish. And then by your Holy Spirit, clean those things away and turn me to where I have a life that is more Christ-centered, more about loving God instead of loving myself. That feels good because selfishness is never fulfilling. Question eight. Coming from a different church that believed once saved, always saved, do Methodists believe this? I find it confusing. You're not the only one. Um, John Wesley believed that you could fall away, but he also believed that an assurance of faith was a great gift that God gave to believers. There are several scriptures that talk about an assurance of faith, that, that sense of knowing, that feeling inside of our heart that we belong to God and he belongs to us. Hebrews 10, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of, of faith. You know, the real problem with that question is it, it kind of holds up this idea that we can kind of punch our ticket for eternity and then do whatever we want. And, and I hope you don't think of, of your life in Christ that way. I, I want to encourage you. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a one-time decision thing. That, that a, a, your life in, in Christ is, is based on ongoing decisions. Every day, you, you're renewing your heart by the work of the Holy Spirit in you. You shouldn't just have one conversion story in your life. You should have many, many. There's this ongoing sense that we need to be made new in Him. Uh, so the Christian that is pursuing a faithful Christian life shouldn't sit around and worry about if their salvation is good. 
Usually this is a question we ask when we see someone who appeared to be a Christian but now has fallen away and is doing whatever they want. And you know what I have to say about that? It's not our job to decide. It's not our job to decide who the good ones are. We need to love those people, care about those people, and do everything we can uh, to help them without scaring them or beating them up to find uh, God's love. Question nine. Why are there so many religions, so many denominations? What did God intend? Not this. Um, and I'll let you read this on your, uh, some other time, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 to 13. But think about it. How many varieties of Methodists are there? 10, 15? How many varieties of Baptists are there? 10 or 15? Presbyterians. I mean, name all of the groups. There's a gazillion of them. It's hilarious. We have divided over things that mean nothing. We have taken up the, the cause and mounted our horses and pulled our swords over, over issues that mean nothing. And here's the thing that just cracks me up about this. On the other side of the river, God's bringing us all back to one house. And all of those people who are out there saying, we are the church, man, are they going to be? I didn't think Methodists got to come in. Well, you know what, folks? In God's house, there's one house. There's not going to be all these denominations. There's not going to be all these other places that are fighting over communion or all the other issues that, that, that we tend to fight about. On the other side of the river, we're all going to live in the same place. Question 11. We're frightened by the corruption in politics and frightened for the future. I pray for our country all the time. I'm confused, and I wonder why all of this is happening. Well, there's one person in our congregation, at least, that's concerned about what they see on the news. I had a very wise man tell me, remind me this week, of something that all of, it's something all of us know, but all of us have to think about. The only thing that matters you already have, and no one can take it away from you. When I feel fearful, I think, my goodness, I've been trusting the wrong things. I've been trusting security and possessions. I've been doing what Americans do. And this fear reminds me that those things come and go, but we put our trust in Christ alone. Question 13. How do you know if you're really a Christian? Do you ever feel empty and wonder, am I saved? Uh, I was talking to somebody this morning. I asked them, how are, how are you doing? They said, average. You ever feel average? You ever feel below average? It's embarrassing when you're the preacher and you're coming to church and you go, man, I'm just, I feel bad as a Christian today. You know, I just don't feel like God loves me anymore. I mean, our minds do funny things. I, I want to I ask you a question. When you got down to business with God in your life, wherever that happened, whenever that happened, when, were you sincere? I'm not asking you how you felt. I'm not asking you if you swung on a chandelier. I don't care if you kneeled and walked the sawdust trail. I don't care if a preacher was there or not. I just want to ask you a question. Were you sincere? When you called out to God, were you sincere? See, the root of a relationship with God is a sincere commitment. It's not based on how we feel. It's not even based anymore on what we do or what we've done. Some months ago, a young person in my house did a, a big something. And they said to me, maybe you don't love me anymore. Wrong. Wrong, right? Here's the funny thing. I don't even remember what they did. And I don't even remember which one of them was it was that did it. We're all worried about what we've done. We're all worried about how we feel. And we forget that as we made our commitment to God, he made a commitment to us. And each of you, every single one of us, can have a sense of security, can have a sense of assurance in our life because it's not based on how we feel. If you need more, spend time in prayer. Learn to trust him. 
Work the spiritual disciplines. Spend time in the scriptures. Build your relationship up with him, but never feel like you are not loved by God. When you chose him that day, when you became aware that you had been choosing him all those years, the seal of the Holy Spirit was placed on your heart, on your life. You belong to him, and he belongs to you. Let us pray. Let your spirit, O oh God, fill each person, not just now, but in those moments of worry and concern, when it feels as though the heavens are brass, when it feels as though you are far away, when we wonder about our future, remind each one that you are present, that you are faithful, that you are there. Embrace us, care for us, and take us forward one day at a time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.